students as we remember those who are struggling um, with everything from COVID to homelessness to depression to loneliness. Um, so let's just take a moment of silence. Thank you everyone and thanks um, for wearing your hats as you are able to, Bo, as always. Um, so our agenda is, uh, this is the COVID office hours that's sort of uh, where our partners do updates. Uh, we don't do a deep dive on a particular subject uh, with an outside expert. Um, Linda is our inside expert, so you'll be hearing from her later. Um, and then the next meeting, we've got a special topic that we'll uh, introduce in a bit. So welcome, 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 um, and TGIF as always. So a couple of announcements. Do, 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 do. Um, as we enter the holiday season, uh, the CDC has given us some holiday guidance. So a reminder to folks who may be new to the call, all of the underlined uh, words are a live link that goes to a website. So this one that says holiday celebrations and small gatherings, you click on that, that goes directly to the CDC website that talks about how you now have a valid excuse for not going to any of your relatives over the holidays. Stay at home, watch old movies. So that um, is some good uh, and updated guidance on that. Um, the next uh, updated um, infographic is for shelters. If you click on help stop the spread of COVID-19, you will see the full uh, poster of which a portion of it is uh, to the left of the screen. So click on that, print it, and post it uh, wherever you can. Um, probably wouldn't be a bad idea to put it in your offices if you're meeting in person there as well. So that's just a one pager uh, that's made possible to you. And the same as the next one, the CDC infographic on response to uh, symptoms. The bottom portion is just a, a part of the poster that you'll see when you click on what to do in a shelter when someone shows COVID symptoms. So hopefully you've seen some of these um, materials or a version of them now that we're however many months into this epidemic. Uh, but please, again, click on it, print it, um, and post it. So uh, the next slide is just a uh, infomercial um, for an upcoming uh, webinar that the Connecticut State Department of Education is going to present. Um, I don't know if Lou's on the call, and if he is, if he has anything he wants to add to this, but that's next Tuesday, December 8th. It's in the evening, um, and... Uh, it's revolving uh, families who are stuck doing remote learning. And um, apologies to all of you who are parents doing that, even as you're with us in our COVID office hours, it's, it's a real struggle. And so um, kudos to you as one whose child is out of the house. Um, Okay, so without further ado, um, Steve, you got any updates from the Department of Housing? Always takes me a minute to find that unmute button depending on whatever platform I'm using here. So sure, a couple of updates we have here are, um, we were awarded 100 mainstream vouchers uh, from HUD, uh, we let the CANs know the breakout of those vouchers. Uh, so we were able to um, give them out. So this can actually make a nice debt in both our chronic and family uh, homeless numbers. When you look at that, uh, we can get pretty far uh, with folks that are currently in shelter. So we're excited about that. 
uh, in terms of cold weather protocol, uh, we have all of our hotels up and running from the cans from what they've asked for. So that's about 425 rooms across the state at this point in time. Uh, if anything changes in terms of protocols, just let us know. Uh, if more space is available, we can work um, with our DAS partners to get that available. <clears throat> and other funding is still coming down the pike uh, to staff those hotels, uh, provide homeless outreach dollars. Um, everybody is given award letters. So now we're just in the tedious process of actually doing the contracts. Um, so we should have most of those complete within the next two weeks. So all of that funding will be out there. Um, so I think we're in a relatively good position um, with uh, access and ability to gain housing. Um, so we're pretty excited as we head the winter months that we have enough uh, warm spaces so folks um, can access if they so choose. And I'll turn it back to you, John. Super. Hey, I see Lou now. Uh, Lou, do you want to uh, say anything about the commercial we just gave you for the CSDE webinar? Do you know that that's going on under your auspices? Which webinar? I, I, I don't know what webinar, webinar you're talking about. Uh, scroll back one. You see it? Oh, okay. That's... Uh... That's, well, it's, it's not something that I'm putting on. It is a town hall that the uh, Judy Carson and the um, uh, Family Community Partnerships uh, are putting on. So I don't really know a lot of details about it, um, but I would encourage you to have folks connect. And I would also encourage, I mean, I know, I don't know if any folks have gotten to take a chance to look at the uh, attendance uh, data that has been getting released on a monthly basis, but it does show that students who are identified as being homeless are um, uh, at significantly greater risk of being chronically absent, even like almost 10 percentage points lower than normal, which is still considered chronically absent in a good year, a non-pandemic year. So uh, we had a webinar this past week um, with attendance and McKinney-Vento liaisons sort of highlighting that issue and thinking about, you know, potential solutions to, because uh, we think that a large percentage of those kids, roughly over 40% of them are probably, are, are, are connecting virtually only. Um, so it's thinking about strategies to sort of keep students connected, particularly homeless students connected to school even to the extent of prioritizing those students for in-person classroom learning if they're taking steps to do any kind of hybrid approaches. So, you know, we are looking at the issue. And in addition to that, um, just to bring it up, our identification rates um, for, uh, you know, we take a look every October at a census of school districts and our October identification rates for this year are down 20 per, uh, 25% than where they were last year. So we know that significantly less students, and this is a nationwide trend, I think it's like close to, uh, estimated close to half a million less students being identified in school districts throughout the country right now. Here in Connecticut, that's at 25% less um, than last year. So, you know, we're really trying to highlight the issue with school districts that they have to be diligent, not only about the attendance issue, of course, but identification is an ongoing thing. We always have to be very diligent about connecting with families and understanding what their housing circumstances are uh, to ensure that their students are, are stay connected to school in any way possible, so. Great, thanks for that update and thank you for doing what you do. Uh, Alice, what do you got from uh, Demas? So we, uh, <clears throat> Excuse me, we extended the um, DMS waivers related to electronic signatures and in home visits um, through the month of July, not July, God, the month of January. If we go through July, I might lose my mind. Um, uh, through the month of January. Um, and I also wanted to remind everyone who's interested, we are having a chess provider um, information webinar, not webinar, uh, like meeting on Wednesday at 10 a.m. If people haven't gotten the um, invitation for that, let me know um, and we can get it out to you. It's, um, it, it's just an hour to talk about where we are with the CHESS application and um, 
uh, you know, any changes that have happened. We haven't had a provider engagement meeting in probably close to a year. So we just want to give you kind of an update of where we are and, and where we think we, um, where we're going to end up. So um, that is my brief update for today. And I did find, I can't, I don't have any Christmas gear yet. My Christmas gear is not out. So I'm just going with my old tiara. I love it. I love it. Um, okay, next slide, uh, David Gonzalez Rice. Do you want to speak to this one as um, Linda starts to tee up for her presentation? Great. Good morning. Thanks, everyone. What I wanted to focus on there is a link embedded down here. So if this applies to you, look for the slides, apply for that link, or email me, dgrice at cceh.org, after the presentation. We were approached uh, late October by contacts at the Department of Public Health to kick off a um, critical workforce, early vaccine access planning process. Um, and, uh, you know, there are staff at the Department of Public Health who are reaching out to a number of sectors and industries, uh, ranging from petroleum to transportation to healthcare and to us, the homeless services sector. Uh, so what we have done to date is we distributed that Department of Public Health memo, which includes a link to a survey um, asking providers who have staff who serve uh, clients, consumers, members of the public face-to-face -face and are not able to work remotely or to socially distance at work to identify those staff and um, have their numbers incorporated into the uh, statewide planning for vaccine access. Um, back when we sent this around, it was uh, you know mere days before the election this question of vaccine emergency use authorizations was totally novel to me it was not yet in the news news has traveled fast though this is on the top of all of our minds the governor's press conference yesterday spoke to this issue um, so what where we are at now is uh cycling back to department of public health we met them yesterday to look at our uh, thank you lauren uh, to look at the response rates to that survey I'm cross-checking that with our list of the agencies that we would expect to have responded, and I'll be doing some targeted outreach uh, where it looks to us as though uh, one of your organizations has not responded. A number of you have. We're really grateful for that. And I'll mention, too, there's a new um, consultant who's been brought on board over at Department of Public Health to get this process a bit more organized. Uh, they were really, uh, back when we first spoke uh, in late October, they had gotten sort of surprising um, uh, uh, guidance from the CDC to have a, a plan in place by November 4th. Uh, and uh, I, reading between the lines, I think it was unclear to some of our colleagues working at the state how much of that coming down from the feds was a politicized uh, timeline and how real it was. But now we really are in a period of earnest planning, uh, knowing which actual vaccine products are going to be coming out. So. Um, do watch for a note from me or one of my other colleagues at CCH uh, to prompt you to do this. If you uh, did not see any of these communications uh, or are not sure whether someone at your agency uh, did complete this survey, uh, feel free to reach out and I can let you know the status of that as well. Great. Thanks, David. Thanks for doing what you do. And now, without further ado, an update on COVID testing with Linda. Take it away, Linda. Good morning, everyone. And just another time for us to update our COVID testing. Um, as you can see in the next slide, just a few things we'll talk about, trying to keep this to a tight minimum here. Um, next slide, please. There we go. We'll talk about the testing. We always talk about the state. How do we compare to the state? Um, and then we'll talk about results by CAN and just give you an overall testing uh, update. So that's the plan for this morning. Next slide, yeah. I know this is busy, but this is something that if you get used to seeing this, you'll see uh, that it shows the current cumulative statewide numbers, um, which everyone has seen are ticking up uh, in, in, a, in, they're spiking actually in the past few days. Yesterday was over 7% positivity for the testing rates. Um, we're not seeing that. Again, we don't have the volume quite to, to compare that, so we compare it every two weeks, but we are below average uh, compared to the state. I do want to point out that we do have three current positive cases. Uh, they are all in Eastern Can. And a few things to note that I'd just like to share with folks. Uh, we're starting to see 
positive tests come in for people who don't have HMI as enrollments. And what that what I'm seeing is literally a test result and a test location, but I have no idea who these people are. There's no, there's no other identifying information. So if you have something, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing those are folks who may be in hotels who don't have an enrollment. If that is uh, sounding similar to your situation, if you would please, please, please get them an enrollment. It doesn't have to be a full ES enrollment, an emergency shelter enrollment. You do have the option in HMIS to have a COVID housing enrollment. And if you, if you forgot how to do that, uh, certainly reach out to me. I can show you. It's very quick, very simple, but we just need some way to track these. And the reason I bring that up is uh, out of those three positive cases, uh, one person we know exactly who, who he is. Um, the other two folks were our youth, 23-year-old youth who, are, who were, according to the record, shown to be um, diverted either at or before their CAN appointment, and yet they showed up as having a matched housing on the BNL. So just kind of, again, questioning uh, what could be happening here. So please just keep, uh, I know everyone's doing such a good job in general, but just a little uh, note there that uh, we're seeing some inconsistencies in terms of um, some of the data, um, not just from people who have uh, enrollments, but also people who are not currently in the system. So that's what we've got for that. Um, and the next slide, talks a little bit about the, uh, again, the statewide numbers. I keep posting this, hopefully this is uh, of interest. It's just, again, our cumulative positive test rates across the country, you can see there. Uh, they've all ticked up, at least in Hartford and Greater uh, New Haven, they've ticked up a little bit, as well as in Eastern. I do wanna commend Eastern, they are doing, I, I've seen, I'm seeing a lot more test results going into the system, so thank you for that, that's fantastic. And again, if you test, you will find, as we're seeing here, those three current positive cases in Eastern. Next slide. And again, this is showing you by CAN uh, the testing results that we have entered so far. We're up to over 1,500 results in HMIS. Uh, it looks, again, Hartford's doing a great job. I mean, they're all, you're all doing a great job, right? Everyone's continuing. Um, so keep it up and keep getting those uh, tests in. You're seeing some of the blank uh, CANs. Those if you see in the second uh, column on the chart there, there's blanks. We just don't know what can those are from. Some of those are what I referenced earlier in terms of not knowing uh, any more identifying information about where these folks are, uh, where they're being tested. Next slide. So I'd like to show again, this is really important because this is showing our, our overall statewide test per month. And you can see, we know what, I'm going to keep updating this every time we speak until we get to the day where COVID is a thing of the past. But you can see, as we talked about in May and June, we had really high numbers. Um, good news is, and after the little dip in September and October, you're seeing that in, in November, we did have a nice uh, 45 uh, increase in the number of tests being recorded. So again, just keep, keep up the, the valiant effort here. Um, and we did have some higher numbers here, as I mentioned, uh, went back in time and adjusted for those folks who did not have HMIS enrollments that were not being tracked. Um, so those numbers, if you compare this to the last presentation I did, uh, you'll see a little bit of an uptick. There's 69 cases over the entire time frame since March that we've been tracking and four in just the past uh, few uh, two week period. The last two slides, I just want folks to see, you know, you've seen these, these are the statewide numbers. We talk about the red zones. This is our state. This is actually, it says no, December 1st. It was actually uh, yesterday that I looked at this as well and it hadn't changed at all. So you can see that this is, uh, you know, four, uh, 15 or more cases per 100,000 across the state. It is just, it is everywhere. Uh, and even the, the, the parts of the state that are showing in gray right now, which are low, they're surrounded by, or orange, they're surrounded by red. So it is spreading at a, an incredible pace. And the next slide talks also about the statewide numbers for both probable and confirmed cases uh, compared to when we started tracking this as a state in March. And you can see we're just exponentially, uh, we're going in the wrong direction. And you keep hearing, and certainly Dr. Anthony Fauci saying a surge upon a surge, and this is what we're seeing statewide. So I just throw these in just to kind of remind folks, as if everyone knows, you know, already, but just a reminder visually of, of how uh, this is spreading so fast. And again, we just appreciate so much your efforts to continue that testing. That is the only way, in addition to all the social measures, the masks and the distancing um, and the hand washing, just please keep up the testing. We, we, uh, it, it is going to be um, a, a rough season ahead. So that's the update for COVID. Uh, look forward to the day. I will not be giving these when we have the vaccines in place and everyone's all set. Um, if you have any questions, certainly reach out. Thank you. Super, thanks, Linda. Any uh, questions in the chat? I don't think so, no. All right, so let's go to some uh, 
boss updates uh, and here to discuss the next couple slides is Suzanne Wagner. So uh, morning everybody and um, this is you know kind of a dog and pony show about testing and how important it is uh, kind of following on what Linda just talked about about the surge in cases around the country um, is um, getting people tested. And when we look at the number, like that 800 people have been tested, 774, um, uh, you know, we know there are uh, thousands of homeless people in shelters. Um, and we also know there are thousands of people in permanent supportive housing. And I'm assuming that Linda, when you're reporting, so just jump in on this, that you're including any PSH tests as well. because. Uh, all the tests that come in, we get every single test that's recorded. I'm just reporting on that slide on the ES, on the emergency shelters, but yes, we get tests from everywhere. Okay. So, um, and we know that, you know, when you have congregate situations, probably people feel a little more pressed to get people tested and single site, maybe less, scatter site less. I mean, um, but anyway, we wanted to just give some strategies for improving testing update, um, uptake. And last uh, month's COVID hours, office hours, looked at vaccine hesitancy. And I hope um, all of you looked at the slides if you couldn't attend, because it was a really great presentation. And we're going to have a follow-up with those guys in January. But um, similar to vaccine hesitancy, people are hesitant to take tests for a variety of reasons. Um, and some strategies to try and increase people's um, taking of tests, uh, because it is voluntary for clients or residents or guests of your, of your programs to take tests. But um, what we did learn was that data and statistics are not as powerful as peer support, community support, uh, support from trusted people who you believe um, can tell you about the vaccine, I mean the testing, and uh, can be a role model for others. Um, trying to use peers to provide education, people who have been tested, using them to talk about what it was like, providing inf information that's science-based to people about the tests, um, being non-judgmental, helping people evaluate the pros and cons and the risks and benefits of taking tests. You know, we want to give people a forum to talk about rather than just saying, hey, Joe, Jane, whatever, Jim, do you want to test? They're here, we're going, whatever. But to have a, a more of an engaged conversation one-on-one -on -one if possible, especially with some of our high-risk folks, and helping them to talk through why they may be reluctant to get a test, what their fears are, what might make them more comfortable, um, and helping people um, feel like that there's, um, uh, that, that they've made a considered decision. Um, and we're not just telling them what to do, or just saying that you said no, but you know, we'll take that. But to think about asking people what their concerns are, acknowledging those concerns, and advising people. So, as well as incentives, and we're going to talk a little bit more about incentives in a minute. Oh, I'm advancing slides, but I don't have control. Liz, can you move to the next slide? Um, so, here's a, a model from substance abuse treatment where uh, it's an EBP. Actually, we used this at CUCS way back in the day. Um, with one of our programs where people get uh, small amounts of money when they test free of drugs. And um, you can read the details of, about this. Sometimes you get money when you draw a slip of paper, sometimes you get encouragement, um, but the more negative tests you have, the more picks you get. And that incentivizes people not only to get tested, but to test clean. And you can use a similar uh, model here to uh, incentivize uh, getting tested for COVID. Next slide, please. Another alternative is to have some kind of a prize um, and on the, on the wall for getting tested and having people select what prize they wanna get for getting a test. Now, uh, I know I had asked about whether we could fund this, these kind of incentives with HUD money and I'm going to flip to Lauren. I know she wrote back to me about this and I think we were waiting for some clarification about HUD funds on whether we can use HUD funds to pay for kind of incentives or prizes or rewards for this process. 
Yeah, so I, um, I took a look and I'm happy to send if anyone um, wants the specific citation from the interim rule. Um, I think probably HUD would find it eligible under the um, supportive services budget line item. There's a, um, you know, there's a, a way to pay for outpatient health services. The caveat is that the service has to be provided by a licensed um, medical professional, but since the testing itself would be provided by the licensed medical professional, obviously, um, you, I think you may be able to slip in under there. Um, but I am going to, I am going to submit this question to HUD today on their office hours and see if I can get a quick response for everyone. And uh, if I'm not able to get a quick response today, I will submit it through the AAQ process and who knows when we will get a response. Okay. Because uh, we realize that this is, you know, in order to in, offer these kinds of incentives, you have to have a way to pay for them. Some of you may have more flexible funds that you can use. Um, certainly, we do know uh, from lots of research studies that small incentives do can, in fact, um, increase uh, people's uptake on things. Liz, you want to advance the next slide, please? Suzanne, just real quick, I just wanted sure. to say you can't give cash, right? So if you were going to give, if you were going to give cash, you would not be able to fund it through the or gift cards. You would not be able to fund it through the COC funds, but um, but you could give prizes, right? So potentially, if you were, you know, you would you would use the COC funds to purchase prizes that that had a value to people. But so not. like shampoo or yeah, whatever, coat dogs, or hats, whatever hats. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we don't want to give you options that you can't uh, uh, use. Although money really works great, but you know, um, prizes, if there are things people want, and maybe that's a way to engage consumers who have gotten tested in giving input into the kinds of things that might be good incentives for other people to increase their testing rates. You know, the kind of prizes that people want. What are the things that are hard to get, um, um, you know, uh, and that they need and that people need. So um, in uh, January 2021 already, January 8th, we have our next um, office hours where we do a deep dive on a subject and we have our wonderful friends from the Community Health Center coming back um, and Andrea White from our team will be facilitating uh, a further discussion about vaccine and COVID testing hesitancy and addressing those things. And they did, again, a great job. If you go back to our office hours from November uh, on the website, um, you can uh, see that PowerPoint and uh, I think it was really helpful information, but uh, join us in January for, for uh, a deeper dive. I mean, now that we are talking about vaccine, um, which is exciting uh, in this discussion about COVID and, and David talked about the, you know, the rollout of who will be prioritized um, now, our next challenge will be, and we know Dr. Fauci is getting quoted a second time, we really need 70 to 80 percent uptake on the vaccine to really have an impact. Um, and that hesitancy on testing is problematic, but hesitancy on the vaccine is going to be particularly problematic. And we want to be able to help people feel comfortable um, getting the vaccine once it's available to them. And I was so happy to hear yesterday that our three um, former presidents came out and said that they would be first in line uh, to get the vaccine uh, should it come out. So, um, and again, we know from that presentation that role models and people you trust saying this is okay is really important. Anyway, uh, there's some vaccine resources for you. Again, as John mentions, there are links. You can go and uh, get information. It is really important to make sure people have information and we don't want to wait till the vaccine plan is rolled out. We want to start providing education about the vaccine now. What are the companies? What trials has it been through? You know, giving information to our staff and our clients about this vaccine and starting to environmentalize uh, this discussion. Uh, next slide, Liz. Okay. I think we are yep. at the... We're just wrapping it up and uh, we will meet before January 8th at our steering committee meeting. So for those of you who attend that, that's going to be December 18th. Just note that it's going to be an hour and a half. Um, we're going to work uh, and allow our partners from CSH who are doing the um, clip 
Consumer Leadership Involvement Project. Did I get that right? Yay. To um, actually do a focus group with uh, you all. Um, those of us who are, are co-chairs will step out of the, the meeting and it will, um, they'll spend about 45 minutes with you sort of picking your brain about ways that we can um, have a more equitable structure around boss and um, the cans and uh, consumer involvement and all of that good stuff. So uh, please uh, allow an extra half hour for that December 18th meeting. Our links are the same. Um, and then the, the slides that we always provide to you are our links on um, COVID and our partners uh, from the federal on down to the state. Um, and then of course we always but only list um, our folks from Housing Innovations as your contact people. Um, but in truth, if you want to contact either Steve, Alice, Monique, or myself as your four co-chairs, um, feel free to do that as well. So, so John, there's a question in the chat about yep. mandating vaccines for clients and staff. And, and I know I've, I've, I've read some about mandating vaccines for staff and as some companies are doing it, some are not. You certainly want to talk to your HR lawyer for your organization about whether you do that. You know, being a frontline healthcare worker might be different from, you know, in a hospital might be different um, on that. So I know there's been debate about that. I don't think we can mandate clients, but I know we have a lot of folks on the phone who might uh, or on this call who might be able to talk about that um, yes you can mandate staff but you have to make sure that there is an exemption opportunity for folks who for religious reasons allergies to what's in the um, uh, vaccine itself or uh, what have you and that the, the legal advice that I was just on a call earlier today was don't take a hard line, but um, tr try to figure out why people are resistant to the vaccine and see if you can overcome that with um, facts and, and logic. And also um, <clears throat> it does appear that if somebody refuses to be vaccinated you and they're able to work from home, you could make uh, accommodations, but you don't have to. So it, it's going to be a dicey situation, and uh, basically the lawyer said, "Stay tuned." Um, but that was related to staff, not to uh, clients. Anyone else on the call have any? Uh, Just want to add one comment. This is Linda. Uh, one thing that I was reading was for for staff uh, vaccinations, you may want to consider staggering them because you don't know the side effects so you don't want to have your entire staff perhaps come down and, and, and not be able to work so one suggestion that was given to the hospital systems was to, to stagger staff i think that would apply to to um our staff as well great well and i think that piece comes from the presentation last month about making sure people have information and this goes to the follow-up question about managing mask wearing and so on is making sure people understand you get the vaccination. That means you are not at risk for this amount of time so that in fact, when could you stop wearing a mask? Um, you know, I don't know the answer to that because I don't think we have that information yet, but getting a lot of information about these vaccines, how they work, what side effects you're gonna feel are, people always won't think they're gonna get sick from a vaccine. That's a kind of like a universal human thing. Will they in fact get sick? So making sure, and we'll be certainly providing as much information as we can um, about this, of course, um, as it rolls out, uh, you know, in our calls and in our, our, our different, uh, on the website, trying to provide information. I'm sure CCH will as well uh, be providing information on the vaccines as we learn more about them. Mm -hmm. All right, and um, you absolutely, as um, employers can require that your staff wear masks, so even if you're at a place where they say, hey, I've been vaccinated, I don't want to wear it, you have control over the, um, I think they call it the workplace environment. And so if you 
want to set an expectation, you can. And in fact, you can set higher expectations than the guidelines that are given by the CDC. So I found that an interesting piece of information from this morning. Um, and Susie uh, says that she read on the CDC site that you should still wear a mask because of the vaccine will not be effective. Say that word out loud, efficacious for everyone. So good, good discussion. Other input, um, we, uh, we've, we've trained ourselves so well that we've gotten through all of the slides in a very short uh, amount of time. So I, I don't want to keep us long because what I'm going to say is going to be contradictory to me keeping us long. Um, I was watching the news the other day and there was a psychologist or psychiatrist, I can't remember, from Ohio on talking about Zoom fatigue and how it's very real. <laughs> and um, she was saying that if she was the, how did she phrase it? The meeting organizer queen, which I loved when people refer to themselves as queens. Um, she said if she was a meeting organizing queen, she would have meetings start on the hour and then end at 55 minutes so that everyone gets a five minute break in between if they have meetings backed up. So um, I am going to try when I'm running a meeting to implement that because I think it's very true. Like we no longer have that time to drive to a meeting or walk to a meeting. We're like Hanging, hanging up and calling in. So uh, I, for one, John, appreciate that you're following the Queen's advice and giving us time back. Well, as your meeting organizing Queen for the morning, I'm happy to do that for you. So with that, my friends, be well, be safe. Um, you know, distant hug somebody and um, we'll see you back here, many of you, December 18th. And Suzanne, last, no, you had your hand up? No, I was just saying, yep. Oh, okay. Everyone do the peace sign. Come on. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye, Take everybody. Care. Thanks, everyone. Thank Take you. good Bye. care.